All right. Hello and welcome to the webinar, Tackling Platinum Resistant Ovarian Cancer. I'm Maggie Nicholas Alexander, the Senior Director of Gynecologic Cancer Patient Support and Education at SHARE. Before the presentation begins, I'd like to tell you a little bit about SHARE. SHARE is a national nonprofit that supports, educates, and empowers anyone who has been diagnosed with women's cancers and provides outreach to the general public about signs and symptoms. Because no one should have to face breast, ovarian, uterine, cervical, or metastatic breast cancer alone. For more information about upcoming webinars, support groups, and our helplines, please visit our website at sharecancersupport.org. All participants will be muted during the presentation. When Dr. O'Malley finishes presenting, we will begin the Q&A discussion. You are welcome to give comments in the chat section during the presentation, but please submit questions through the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. When asking questions, remember that Dr. O'Malley is unable to give specific medical advice. So please keep your questions general in nature. I also wanted to mention that closed captioning is available. You can enable this feature by clicking the live transcript button on the bottom of the screen and selecting the subtitle option. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on the SHARE website soon. Now I'd like to introduce today's speaker, who we're so excited to have join us today. Dr. David O'Malley is the Division Director of Gynecologic Oncology within the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology and the James Cancer Hospital and So Love Cancer uh, Solove Research Institute. Dr. O'Malley is currently Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology. A talented surgeon and clinician, Dr. O'Malley has been a productive investigator, having published almost 200 articles. He serves on the editorial board for Gynecologic Oncology, the leading journal in gynecologic cancer. Since 2013, he has served as the Director of Clinical Research for the Gynecologic Oncology Division, developing it into one of the premier clinical research programs in the country. He's overseen and led scores of clinical trials conducted at the James CCC, including co-PI of the NCI LAP's grant while serving as principal investigator for multiple national and international trials. We're so glad to have you here today, Dr. O'Malley, and I'll turn it over to you now. Well, thank you for having me. And uh, it, it's quite an honor to, to talk to such a uh, wonderful group. And, uh, and from an overall standpoint of, of advocacy and education. So I am here at the International Gynecological Cancer Society meeting, which is one of the larger GYN oncology cancers uh, uh, meetings in the country in New York City. So I'm actually in a hallway. So I hope the background noise is, is not too bad. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. And uh, I, I, I think uh, not, my, my assistant uh, embellished uh, uh, it, uh, on that. So I appreciate, I appreciate the wonderful introduction. So we have, um, we're going to go over and this, this may, this could be a little challenging to hear. Uh, you know, we're going to talk about historical benchmarks and, and, and what I consider to contemporary benchmarks, which is what's going on here most recently. And then we talk about what our current landscaping is, and most importantly, the evolving options for treatment through this. You know, ovarian cancer is actually going down in incidence, meaning the number of people are diagnosed a year. And that's because we're we're getting genetic testing, we're identifying women uh, and families, I should say, 
uh, using cascade testing, meaning if somebody's diagnosed with ovarian cancer, everybody should have a genetic test. And then if they have BRCA mutations or, or what's something called Lynch syndrome mutations or other mutations, then we can test family members to see if they have the mutations and then have prophylactic surgery to remove the tubes and ovaries, hopefully then uh, 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 preventing uh, cancer, an extremely high chance to prevent cancer when we do that. And what else? We have new therapies. So less people are dying of ovarian cancer. And, and so it's really amazing that we actually, because less people are dying of cancer, even in the picture of decreasing number of cases being diagnosed, and this is a true testament to patient advocacy by educating how important genetic testing is in identifying those patients so we can test family members. The prevalence, I mean, how many people are alive with ovarian cancer is actually going up and it's going up markedly. And that's a good thing because that means the people who are diagnosed are living much longer. So we really break down how we've defined platinum-resistant ovarian cancer as, as three different aspects, and this is historically. And in, in historically, we've defined this as something called refractory. That's if they had progression or persistence to disease with their first-line therapy. The other is then if they recur within six months of their first line of therapy. That's what we call primary resistance. Then we have this term where we kind of just lump in everybody together, which is what, what I've referred here as acquired or secondary resistance, meaning we'll treat with patients with multiple lines of platinum. They recur each time, but ultimately upon recurral occurrence, almost everybody will become platinum resistant. And we, again, define that as recurring within six months of having a platinum-based therapy. And we look at how we're identifying drugs the, the FDA for in the United States and what's called the EMA in Europe really don't differentiate, do not differentiate uh, at patients who have primary versus acquired resistance. But, but what we've learned, what we've learned is that for people who respond uh, once, twice, sometimes three times and have a good response and then recur within six months, that we can actually retreat those patients uh, with platinum and they respond very, very well. And so really we, in clinical practice, we've stopped using classic terms like platinum resistance. And we started saying no longer, platinum is no longer an option. So, and some people can have had bad allergic reactions. Uh, and then once people progress on a platinum, then obviously we don't use a platinum based therapy. Now, this is really what has, um, uh, uh, is, is humbling. When we look at the, the, what the response rate, and you, you see this in the, the second row, radiologic response rate, that means if they're on a clinical trial and their disease regresses regresses 30%, okay, that the chance of responding of that 30% is only about 16% in the first line, 8% in the second, then goes down from there. And I put up this title, F FDA accelerated approvals. And what that is, is because in order for us to get new drugs to our patients with ovarian cancers, this is one of the bars that we are facing, which is we need to do better than what's available. Be, uh, available. And what the red numbers is I've added here are the what are called the 90% confidence intervals, meaning pay, uh, the, the odds that, that those numbers fall between those groups. So this is really based on a classic study called Aurelia, and that really led to our first approval, first, I shouldn't say first approval, our most significant approval in patients with platinum-resistant ovarian cancer, and we added the drug Bevacivimab, and its trade name is Avastin. It's hard for me to say Bevacivimab, so I say Bev, okay? And what we found was we took patients uh, almost predominantly, almost all in Europe. And we said, there's three different drugs we typically use, paclitaxel, topotecan, and doxel, or pegylated liposomal doxorubicin. And half the people are going to get what we've always done, and half will get that, plus the drug Bev. And what we found was the patients responded much, much better from about an overall response rate of 13 or 12, 12 to 13% to about 27 or 30% if we added BEV 
to chemotherapy. And so when we're really looking at that, it's it's really, those are it, it, uh, what we've used as our control, uh, what are called con controls. So those are the, what we expect for our responses, about 12 up to about 27%. And we look at the different arms of the trial, this was an unplanned analysis, so this was called an exploratory analysis, that the combination of weekly paclitaxel plus BEV was the best response at, in the lower right corner of 52, versus if they didn't have BEV, is about 29%. PLD, or the drug it's called Doxel, was 18% versus 8%, and Topotecan was 3.3 versus 23%. So again, we saw differences between how those arms performed. Now, this is a slide that I have uh, uh, added here uh, most recently. And what we're doing is, again, looking at each one of the most contemporary trials. So at the very bottom is this one that I just quoted, this 12 versus 27% response rate. But in those trials that have been published or, or presented here in the last about three to four years, you see that the response rates are much lower. So the way we use now a uh, 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 platinum with multiple lines of therapy, that patients don't respond as well. And really, when we're looking at this, it's probably about 5 to 15%. I put here 4 to 13%. So this clearly is our greatest unmet need in ovarian cancer is after I would have assistant. And then I, I went down and broke down to say, okay, where are we? Where are we from an overall standpoint of how about patients who treat weekly paclitaxel? And very consistent, about 30% of patients without BEV uh, uh, have a response rate weekly paclitaxel. But how about the other agents? And we're looking at PLD, Topo, another drug called Gemcitabine or, or Gemzar, the response rates, again, are not only are they not 5 to 15%, they're probably 3 to 4 to 8%. So outside of weekly paclitaxel, the response rates are really modest. Now, this is fairly depressing. And, 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 and so I think one of the big important points that we need to look at here is if you're a patient with platinum-resistant ovarian cancer, is the, page, the doctor who's treating you, are they talking to you about clinical trials? Because you see, we only have about three or four drugs we really use in platinum-resistant, and those, tr those drugs outside uh, uh, of weekly paclitaxel are quite modest in their response rates. Now, again, response rates are disease is shrinking. There's also clinical benefit rate, which I did not include here, which would be able to control the disease. And that's much better with these drugs. So to me, that's kind of, that's the bummer part of the talk, right? We, you know, we're, we're, we do really uh, well with, with people living longer, but once they become platinum resistance, it's much more difficult to treat patients. But look at all these trials that are ongoing uh, or have recently completed. And what I've uh, broken down here with the help of my friend, Katie Moore, is basically four different categories. And the, the first one is the, the one I have highlighted here. And these are drugs that we're combining with weekly paclitaxel or uh, other taxane drugs, trying to improve the response rates, okay? And then another thing called antibody drug conjugates, immune therapy, and then something called targeting the DDR pathway, which, uh, or the, in the PARP resistant pathway. And we'll talk about all of these in bigger terms, but, but we will talk about some specific trials. So one of these trials is actually ongoing right now. And it's, it's what we call GOG3044 or, or furoceratib. It's a really neat drug, which is targeting the machinery called the AKT pathway, uh, the machinery within the cells. And we think this may restore platinum, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, chemotherapy uh, sensitivity. So by utilizing this drug, we're looking at it uh, versus weekly paclitaxel. So we expect that, we hope that utilizing this, this drug that uh, targets the machinery, that we can improve the outcomes versus weekly paclitaxel. Now, everybody on this trial gets weekly paclitaxel, but two for every one patients also get the uh, uh, the 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 other new agent called a furosept. Okay. 
Now, this is another trial, which is just getting going here. And this is really interesting. We are also, instead of using weekly paclitaxel here, we're actually using a, a drug, uh, uh, a, a trade's name is, is Taxotere. It's also a taxane drug in that same family as, as paclitaxel. And, and what we're doing is in, in the generic name, I'm sorry, I used the trade name, the, the generic name is NAB paclitaxel. And what we're doing here is uh, we, we actually have found that by disrupting the uh, glucocorticoid receptor, which is it's actually a, a, a hormonal receptor within the tumor cells, that patients um, uh, can do better. And so the, the, this drug, Relicorlant, actually moderates uh, a, 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 that, that, that mechanism. So blocking the, 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 the hormonal or glucocorticoid, it's called. And we think, uh, based on a, a, a smaller study, that this also could in, help us with a weekly taxane and improving treatment. And, and you see here that, again, in the early trials, uh, that the two drugs together uh, were, were quite active. And this, this trial also included some different dosing schedules. So now uh, the other trial that uh, actually we uh, this completed enrollment, and we're hoping to have these results within the next uh, year or so, is utilizing tumor treating fields. These are electric currents, and you actually use arrays. And I'm I was actually the USPI uh, US lead on this trial. That was a multinational study, and these it's pretty amazing. This technology is already approved in brain tumors called glioblastomas, two different indication, and then another. Uh, 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 which is called a uh, tumor called a malignant uh, thoracic mesothelioma. So mesothelioma of, of the lung. And that is these, this, this technology combined with chemotherapy has shown that those chemotherapies work better. So this is a trial we've completed enrollment. We're waiting to, to see if that utilizing these electric arrays, electric currents uh, impacted how uh, well weekly paclitaxel works. And so we're uh, anxiously waiting those results. Another uh, 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 trial, which we're going, uh, that is still enrolling, it's uh, uh, one of its arms has completed, the arm that, that patients had to receive previous uh, bevacivimab for. But this is a trial, GSG3059, uh, uh, sponsored by AeroVive, that is, it targets a, a protein, which has basically been shown to be uh, upregulated in every bad thing that happens in cancer, metastases, poor prognosis, all those things. And what we do is we actually target that was called the gas X and the it's with a, uh, something called an axle decoy. The name's not important, but uh, again, targeting, targeting that, uh, that mechanism to see if we, by utilizing that drug with paclitaxel, weekly paclitaxel again, if we can help weekly paclitaxel uh, uh, improve its its performance. So, you know, again, these are, are three or four uh, that I briefly went over, but again, taking uh, weekly paclitaxel or, or weekly taxane, which we know is a very active agent, uh, and then trying to improve upon those outcomes. The other uh, class of medications called antibody drug conjugates. Antibody drug conjugates are probably one of the most exciting mechanisms uh, or type of class of medications. And when an antibody drug conjugate is there is a, uh, you have to have a, a, an antigen, which is you know a connector on the cancer cells. And those that connector has to not be widely on regular cells because what happens is the antibody connects to the antigen. The antigens on the cell, so it has this 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 lock, and then you have the key. The key goes into the lock, and once the key goes into the lock, it releases its contents into the cancer cells, and then once it releases the the the, the, the into the, uh, the the drug into the cancer cells, then it becomes active. And a lot of these drugs were were too toxic to just to give through the veins, so they have to be a way to get into the cells. And then once they're in the cells, they kill the cells. So it's pretty pretty uh, 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 a wonderful technology that's been approved in in multiple other trials. And there's actually 
uh, two trials that have uh, both completed an enrollment, uh, one with a drug called Mervituximab, the upper with a uh, drug that we call Upri, it's even too hard for me to say. So I, I just, it, it used to be called XM1536. Now it's called uh, Upri, at least that's what I call it. And both of those those drugs have completed enrollment on their trial. And we're, we're again, uh, waiting very anxiously to see the results because we're, we're hoping to have those in our patients with ovarian cancer. Now, due to time, I couldn't get too much into all those trials, but very important, these these drugs, uh, uh, potentially mervtuximab could be available any day. And the, 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 we have to know that the antigen, the lock, is there on the cell. And if it is, it's called folate receptor alpha. So you need to make sure your doctor, once that drug's available, hopefully that drug will be available, that they're testing for folate receptor alpha uh, on the tumor. And it can be from an, old, an older tissue. It does not have to be, does not have to be a new biopsy. Well, immune therapy, which has worked amazing in melanoma and, 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 and certain lung cancers and, and amazing in certain uterine cancers and, and very well in certain cervix cancers, and when I say certain because they had to have a biomarker in them, um, we've really been disappointed in, its, in, in how it's done in ovarian cancer. But it should work. Like, it should work. We can't figure out why it hasn't worked. We have multiple trials that, that shown that it didn't work any better than regular chemotherapy. But we're getting smarter. And now we think by combining it, combining it with other agents, it has a good chance of responding. These are something called waterfall plots. And waterfall plots are, if they're going down and they're below 30%, that means they're an official response. But if they're going down, that means the disease has shrank. And that's obviously very important, even if it doesn't hit that 30% mark. And so we have big national trials and international trials that are looking at improving upon just the regular single agent uh, immune therapy. And it is, and we're, we're trying again, trying to get uh, Combine, combining it with other agents, in this case, uh, 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 agents that uh, uh, target the vascular system, as well as the machinery called uh, uh, DNA repair mechanisms or PARP inhibitors. Now, um, we, we also have a, a new uh, generation of immune therapies, and these are really modifying, modifying the, the uh, way that the body responds. So we're jazzing up the body's immune system. And this one's a cytokine called IL-2. And this drug, uh, nemaleucan, nem, nem, nemaleucan, easier for me to say, nemaleucan, okay? This drug is, is helping rev up the body's immune system, okay? And it's been shown when we combine it with immune therapy, once again, we're getting smarter, when we combine with immune therapy, the response rates uh, are actually uh, quite good. And so this is a big phase three trial. This is going to be a multinational trial. It's just starting, just starting, okay? It's uh, all over the country, really all over the world now, but just starting in the U.S. Big trial, uh, four different arms. And, and uh, you can't say which arm you're going to go on. That's, that's signed randomly. But I just showed you the, what's available, and that's in the bottom four uh, boxes. Uh, uh, PLD or doxyl, paclitaxel, tobotecam, or gemcitabine or gemzar. Okay, so so you you as the patient or the uh, the practitioner uh, can decide on which drug if you get randomized and, and and you have four four chances of getting the combination and nemvolucan plus pembro, which is an immune therapy. Uh, you have a one. Uh, chance to get Pembro alone. You have a one percent chance to get Nemalukin alone, and then you get a four uh, 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 four chance to get. So it's called a four one one four randomization. So um, uh, uh, eight out of ten chance that you get arm one or arm four. But again, really taking the body's immune response, revving it up, and seeing uh, uh, how how we can uh, beat platinum resistant ovarian cancer. Now, targeting DNA replication stress. Now we're getting into a little bit into the weeds here, so I, I don't want to get too much in. But we know the amazing opportunity PARP, PARP inhibitors are, particularly for patients with HRD or BRCA mutations, either in their 
uh, HRD is in the tumor, but in the genes of patients' genes, or if it's in the genes, then it's in the tumor, okay? And so we know that uh, about half the patients uh, are gonna have an HRD mutation or a BRCA mutation. And if they are BRCA, they also have an HRD. So we know about half the patients will have that. And those are the patients that benefit the most. Though actually, when we look at, when we look at patients who don't have those mutations, we even see people benefit also. And so we know that a large number of patients will be getting these drugs, but uh, 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 many patients will become resistant to them. And so we're really trying to say, how do we restore that machinery to, to get them to get them to respond to the drug? And so what we're utilizing is new drugs in, in, in the, 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 the class that are called WE inhibitors, uh, WE1 inhibitors, excuse me. And this is, again, attacking the machinery, getting the machinery to exploit. And then actually in this instant, we're bringing in PARP inhibitors to get that, restore what, that, what, how they responded before, trying to get them to respond again, okay? So uh, this is another trial utilizing, utilizing again, uh, a drug which is attacking the machinery and, and actually uh, Panos Kostinopoulos from uh, Dana-Farber uh, has done uh, uh, amazing work that really showed uh, that the utilization of this drug with gemcitabine seems to really make uh, a lot of sense. So we're going to wrap up here for my part, and I'd be happy to take questions. Our greatest opportunity, I would argue, in platinum is, is, is platinum resistant ovarian cancer. And our greatest opportunity, be, be, because as you saw, I kind of started off with a little bit of a of a, a somber is that our our response rates are modest, but yet when I look at it and talk about all those clinical trials, we would never be pursuing clinical trials unless the response rates seem to be better. And yet, saying that there's no guarantees. So our greatest opportunity to improve care is make sure patients have the opportunity to participate on clinical trials and make sure you're asking about them and your practitioners are asking, uh, uh, talking to you about them. I said at the beginning, I think one of the greatest areas of unmet need is platinum resistant ovarian cancer. But I read in and, and, and not but, excuse me, and we need to cure more patients with ovarian cancer. So those are the two most important, those are the two most important areas of unmet need. We need to continue, continue to search for areas that patients are going to benefit from platinum resistant ovarian cancer treatments. And but it has been a challenge. And understanding the biology, and I alluded to that with one of those slides, understanding the biology, understanding what's happening in the cells are so important important because once they respond to a treatment and then become resistant, we need to know how to attack that resistance. So I'm happy to take any questions. I really appreciate your attention. Um, and I'll, 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 I'll turn it over to Maggie. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. O'Malley, that you just presented so much information, and I'm sure we'll have a lot of questions. And it's great because we have about a half an hour for the Q&A. Um, so we'll get the Q&A started now. Uh, you can still submit questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. We will try to get through all of the submitted questions but we may not be able to due to time constraints. So while people are working on submitting questions, I'm gonna to go to some of the ones that were submitted in advance through the registration form. Uh, so this person is asking, um, how does all of this apply to low grade serous ovarian cancer, which is typically chemo resistant? Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> wow, that was a uh, freak out, a Zoom freak out there. Sorry about that. You're back. <laughs> I, I, I don't know what happened there. I just couldn't get off. As, okay, so ask it again. I'm sorry, Maggie, I was thrown all off by, oh. by trying to get off mute. <laughs> no problem at all. So 
This person is asking, how does this apply to low grade serous ovarian cancer, which is Great typically question. chemo resistant? Yeah, so low grade versus high grade are two completely different diseases. Everything I just talked about was about really high grade epithelial ovarian cancer. It's a great point. Um, and um, with, with time, I, I didn't want to get on the different histologies. But, you know, we used to lump everything together, Maggie. Everything was, we were called lumpers. And I fought it. I fought it for 25 years when I was just a young pup. I had hair and I didn't, my beard wasn't gray, right? And, and I, I, and finally we're smarter now. We say, well, gosh, that doesn't make any sense. Not only are we no longer lumping into histologies, but we're taking high grade serous ovarian cancer and lumping into BRCA mutations, HRD or non HRD. Okay. So, so everything I just talked about really, really had to do with high grade serous ovarian mm -hmm. cancer, low grade, low grade, um, is a completely different, a completely different disease. Okay. And, and saying that there are now trials with low grade um, and I could do a whole low grade talk uh, the opportunities. There never used to be trials. Okay. You could never get anybody or they just lump them into the same old trials that we did everything else. It just didn't make sense. Uh, uh, so they were allowed on my tum tumor treating fields. Cause we did think that would be a good option, but um, uh, mine, it wasn't mine, but I, I was honored to lead it here in the U S mm -hmm. um, the, 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 the there are in the molecular subtyping is so important. Okay. Mm -hmm. So getting testing and knowing a, a, a potential mechanism that you can target. And now there's clinical trials. So it's just not making stuff up where we're just doing everything on our own, but we're able to really follow people with clinical trials. And Maggie, one of the best thing about clinical trials, I tell my patients this all the time. My only goal is to benefit the patient who's sitting in front of me. Mm -hmm. Okay. However, the altruism associated participant in clinical trials. Just think if the clinical trial that you participate on, you, whoever you is, participate on, change the care of how we treat women for generations. Mm -hmm. Think about the impact of that. You know, I tell my kids all the time, just try to leave the world a little better place than you, than you found it, right? Think about that. The altruism, yes, I absolutely hope that trial works for you. But the altruism of potentially changing the way we treat women with ovarian cancer in the future is important. Coming back to the question from uh, the participant, low grade is a completely different mm -hmm. ball game. Clinical trials are unique to that uh, for low grade and now are available and previously they weren't. And making sure your tumor is getting tested uh, by uh, molecular testing not called next generation sequencing. Great, thank you. And yeah, just further highlights the importance of clinical trials. Uh, so now we have a question asking whether uh, Pembro is the only immunotherapy available now. Nemvalucan is also an uh, immunotherapy, but not available yet, right? Correct. So Nemvalucan is only available um, on clinical trial. Uh, Pembro is not available on, uh, for ovarian cancer unless you're part of a clinical trial or unless you have something called TMB high or mismatch repair deficient. And uh, there are patients, particularly who have non-serous ovarian cancer, it's extremely rare in serous ovarian cancer. I've seen probably one or two in my career, um, who have endometrioid, mucinous, or clear cell. Remember I said we used to lump everything together, now we don't. Those three histological subtypes, when I mean histology, what they look like underneath the microscope, sorry about that. Those subtypes are again, a, a different evil. They're just each one of them, I, I shouldn't say different evil, but in my way, I'm looking at if, if ovarian cancer recurs as an evil, I'm gonna knock it down, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so, so it's a completely different disease. We do, a lot of our data has, as in the past, we've lump, we lumped everything together. So if you have a clear cell, mucinous endometrioid, again, testing for MMR deficiency, MSI, MSI is another word, uh, another test. It's not a word, it's another test, okay? Uh, those are, or TMB, tumor mutational burden, okay? Those tests should definitely be performed on all patients with those histologies because they will have mutations in their tumor, which will make them more susceptible to uh, 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 
immune therapy. I actually uh, have had an amazing uh, responses in patients with those uh, mutational uh, changes uh, that we discovered by testing the tumor. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, so this person is asking whether folate, folate receptor alpha testing um, is standard for most ovarian cancers. It's not. Uh, it's not yet. It's not yet. It, and it really has only been, it only has been tested on clinical trial. The, there's a, a big process when you go for FDA approval, and this is all publicly, I'm not saying anything that's not been publicly stated. Okay. So the, the, the company Immunogen is publicly stated and the FDA is publicly stated that we should have an answer by the end of November if the drug will be approved or not in, in the, in what's called the early approval called the accelerated approval. So if by, by November, hopefully we have, uh, our patients have access to the drug and, but it will only be, well, I anticipate since this is what the trial was, those that have high folate receptor alpha, and there's a whole test. Mm -hmm. So how are we going to do that? That is yet to be determined probably the big labs that the lab that you go to will send out, but you'll have to ask your doctor, am I high folate receptor alpha? And they'll have to get that tested. The testing right now, my understanding is not available, but more to come on that very shortly. And obviously if you have platinum resistant ovarian cancer, you want your physician testing that. So you know that you have the uh, ability to receive that drug. Great. Thank you. Okay, so this person is asking um, if any of these categories of treatment would be, are used for liver metastasis. So that's a really interesting question. And I um, just had a big meeting recently um, looking at uh, so I'm sorry I had to move around, Maggie. I'm not uh, I'm not jumping around. I was just sitting on the floor and and I, I was my legs were starting to fall asleep, so I just sit up a little bit. Uh, so so we have so that's a really interesting question. So we know that liver metastases probably behave differently. Okay, unfortunately, we don't know how to treat them differently yet. Okay, so this is an avenue for for research now there are some really cool new technologies coming uh, that are that potentially are available that were not available that long ago so what you want to do is if you have disease which is limited to the liver okay because if you have disease that's a lot of places besides the liver then you have to treat that disease and so but it's, there are some rare types of, of patients uh, that the disease is really limited to the liver. So you want to go see uh, uh, an oncologist who specializes in liver uh, problems. And, and I partner with those oncologists all the time. And they then have relationships with interventional radiologists and radiation oncologists. And maybe your GY oncologist or medical oncologist has those relationships. But I have found that people who just concentrate on the liver have some, some tricks up their sleeve that, that I don't uh, uh, have access to. And so targeting the liver uh, can be uniquely done. Not as well as we'd like as of right now, but we hope one day uh, to to have drugs which specialize in those with 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 liver mets. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, so this person is asking, well, they're they're saying since Bev carries a risk of bleeding and or blood pressure escalation, are there alternatives that are less risky in that class of medications? So Bev. Bev uh, bleeding risk is actually quite, quite low. And you really look at the numbers, the reasons of needing to stop uh, medications or that cause um, severe problems from bleeding is minuscule. Okay. It's a, annoying, you know, bloody noses, but there's always a patient out there too. And if that's that person, then, then, then that's an issue. The blood pressure issue can be a problem and the kidney issue can be a problem, particularly for people who have been on bed for a long time. And if the blood pressure issues or the kidney issues become so bad that they can't use Bev, that's a little bit 
different story. That should be pretty rare patient though. And for example, I have this amazing nephrologist at Ohio State uh, that, that I work with, Dr. Prosek. He's wonderful. And Dr. Prosek has taught me that he's able to use a, a, a different medications to really help me control the blood pressure. I was pretty good at it. Uh, and my really, I should say my my team and the nurse practitioner I work with were they really helped out a lot on this, but we were pretty good at it, right? But with the help of a multidisciplinary team like our our nephrologist at the Ohio State uh, University and Western Medical Center, that we really uh, have had an, uh, a new ability to get if I really want to keep giving Bev to to utilize that. Now the the really dangerous there's a few dangerous things that can occur. It's something called press and in, in, in the blood pressure can even affect the brain or the brain affects the blood pressure. I'm not sure the chicken or the egg. Um, and, and that is that is reason you have to stop the medication. The real dangerous thing is, is bowel perforation. That's probably in one to 2%, maybe as high as three to 5% of patients with platinum resistant ovarian cancer, depending on, on the patient characteristics. And the bowel perforation when you have a, a platinum resistant ovarian cancer often is deadly. So I'm very straightforward with my patients. And I tell them what I really believe the risk of the bowel perforation rate is, because it's different for everybody. If you have a lot of disease on your bowel, uh, then, then it's going to be higher. If you don't have any disease in your bowel, it's going to be much lower. And so, you know, I'm very straightforward to say, you know, if this occurs, there's a good chance it kills you. Uh, and I hate to be so blunt, but and I've I found that being open and honest with my patients is is the best way to have that dialogue to make sure they tr that they truly understand the risk um, uh, that that they're facing with those medication. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. So the answer is I never. I think you froze. Toxicity in that class of medication is probably the best. It's probably the best tolerated. Great, thank you. And so this person is asking about why HARPs fail at some, some point and specifically what happens biologically. <laughs> you know that wonderful schematic I put up? That's a whole giant paper and a whole different talk in their mouth. That's HARP resistance. Let me simply say, <laughs> cancer is smarter than we are. And almost always on recurrent cancer pain. The cancer figures out a way around the treatment. Okay. Now I used to say always, you heard me say almost. Okay. We are now seeing things we've never seen before. We've never seen before. I never thought I would be saying in my lifetime, I always hoped, God, I hoped. And now I'm there, which is patients with recurrent cancers may be cured or have their disease controlled with recurrent cancer. That was never, ever a realistic hope. And I, you know, I, I still think we really need to start talking about control. I say all the time, I'm not going to compare my high blood pressure or my high cholesterol to, to some, a, a patient with ovarian cancer. But if I didn't take my blood pressure medication, or I didn't take my cholesterol medication, I still have the disease. I still have high blood pressure. I still have high cholesterol, but the treatments I take every day, control it. I hope by my lifetime, that's what I can say about ovarian cancer during my lifetime. Now that heart disease and cholesterol thing may cut that short, but that's a different story for a different day. So we'll get there, you know. So, so um, you know, I think as we look at that, if we had a medication that could control the disease, you gotta take it every day. Maybe you have to come in once every two or three weeks, right? that could control the disease, but didn't get rid of it. Even though it's not completely gone, you're not cured of it. Okay. It's controlled and, 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 and something's going to get us all right, but let's have the best quality of life for as long as possible. So we, and, and we can be on this earth is, and have the type of life we want for as long as possible. Thank you. So this person is asking if there are any specific tests that platinum resistant patients should have. Any specific tests platinum resistant ovarian cancer patients should have. I believe that next generation sequencing. So what am I saying by that? We're looking at the mutations within the tumor. 
okay, mutations within the tumor and potentially within the next two months, folate receptor alpha, okay? Now, there's a clinical two clinical trials with these antibody drug conjugates that are not in platinum resistant, but in platinum sensitive. And if patients are on platinum sensitive therapy, they'll have the opportunity to go on to maintenance with either UPRI or MERV. But you have to have those receptors. You have to have that target. So one of them is called NAPI 2B. One of them is called folate receptor alpha. So though this talk is on platinum resistant, in the future, anybody who's platinum sensitive, you want to ask your doctor, do you have these two trials open? If not, maybe you need to, to, to look for a place that does. And then we test the tumor to see if folate receptor or NAPI 2B, and then potentially go on the trial. So you get access to these drugs before you're platinum resistant or potentially have access to the drugs because against the clinical trials, so you don't you can't say what arm you're gonna you're gonna go on to. Mm -hmm. Now so in the future folate receptor alpha we we believe we believe I, I hope so gosh I hope so if not I'm gonna be so disappointed. Um, and next generation sequencing somatic testing if you look at, for example, the NCC or ASCO guidelines, which are two big, huge guidelines in, in the field of oncology, they basically say patients who have recurrent cancer, we should consider testing the tumor to see if there are mutations which we may be able to are actionable. For example, there's something called ERB2 or HER2 new. Okay, there is. Uh, that there's sometimes mutations we're not expecting that call into question if it's really ovarian cancer. That's a, again a different story for a different day. But um, there are there are you know there are mutations which we can target particularly for patients with non-serious ovarian cancers. Okay, so clear cell, mucinous, ovarian, uh, endometrioid. Excuse me, I said ovarian. Uh, clear cell, low grade, endometrioid mucinous, okay, non-high-grade serious ovarian cancers. But even in high-grade serious ovarian cancers, I check that because maybe as low as 7% of the time, maybe as high as 30% of the time, probably not much higher than that, but maybe it's higher because all the time we're finding more mutations that are actionable uh, that uh, that you can find something that that there may be a drug out there uh, for for you. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. So this person is asking about, they're asking something about a desensitization. Desensitization. So they had, so they had, uh, they and had what response. Is your to, on oh that? gosh, heck yeah. So I've, I have about uh, five papers now in the literature, four papers in the literature inside the NCCN guidelines from within 10 years where we added the hypersensitivity uh, uh, guidelines to those, uh, uh, or desensitization guidelines to the NCCN guidelines. So um, uh, I'm happy to share our protocol, tell your doctor to drop me an email and uh, uh, we'll uh, 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 or reach out to my office and, and we can pass that on. It You have to have experience in it though. And it can, you know, hypersensitivity can uh, can even be deadly. So it's very important to have a, a place or a physician or, or a nursing team that is aware of it. And it is almost always we're able to desensitize people and almost always in the outpatient setting, though there's some places that may make people, everybody go into the hospital there are even some places that maybe go to the ICU. Uh, personally, you know that's not what we do. And uh, it is, it is. If somebody is platinum sensitive, and and they think that the risk outweighs, uh, excuse me, the benefit outweighs the risk, which uh, I believe it almost always, almost always does, almost always, not always. That desensitization is something absolutely to consider. But there are people who um, are just too too. Uh, too hypersensitive and we're not able to get it in. Uh, uh, but that's pretty rare. Could you explain a little bit more about what it specifically is? So it basically is infusing the drug very slowly with a bunch of medications to decrease your chance of, of, of uh, reacting. Okay. So what we do is we, we, we have a four step and a 16 step, and then we have what we call a three bag. That's when people have to come into the hospital. And that's, a, that's over sometimes 12 and 24 hours. 
So uh, usually we're able to do it uh, uh, as an outpatient and we just do it really, really slow. And we kind of keep up ticking and making sure people don't react. By doing it that way, if you do have a reaction, it's very rare to have a severe reaction. Most of the reactions are mild or moderate. And um, and and those are then able to be controlled. Uh, but it's something that, again, you have to go to a center that's, uh, that is comfortable with it and specializes it and is capable of, of taking care because it, it there can be severe, even life-threatening reactions during that period. Okay. Thank you for that explanation. And this person had a second part of their question, which I think is really important because there's a lot of misconceptions about uh, clinical trials. And so they're asking, what about the placebo part of any trial? Yeah, so, so you saw that some of those trials I put up are placebo, but what else did you notice? Now, one of those trials that I put up, the only option was placebo, okay? For example, if you're getting weekly paclitaxel, it's in and 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 you're getting uh, a placebo the, uh, the you're still getting weekly paclitaxel okay so we are not going to put you on a trial platinum resistant ovarian cancer unless we know that you're getting an active agent okay and and so we may say everybody gets weekly paclitaxel but half or two-thirds of the people uh get the new agent okay so and we, and, and I don't know who it is, you know, and so I just assume everybody's on it. Okay. Cause it's called what's called a double blind. So I, cause they don't want us to be skewed in, in our opinions. So what we do is we, we treat everybody that, that are on now saying that um, it would not be ethical uh, to do a trial where it was say weekly paclitaxel versus placebo. Okay, so everybody on the trial is getting an active agent, but not everybody is getting maybe the second agent or the third agent. Okay, so that is that is a ways that uh, uh, we we need to. I'm not going to say we want to. We need to design clinical trials. So if we do it properly, then the FDA will, and, and that trial is positive, then the FDA will say, "Great, now you can bring that." that drug in, into your, in, out in the market for patients. Um, the, we will do placebo controlled trials. For example, the platinum sensitive trials that I was referring to uh, on the, what's called the up next trial, which is the UPRI trial, uh, because the standard practice, the usual practice in some patients is, is not to do therapy after somebody completes, say, six cycles of, of platinum plus a second drug, okay? So in that practice, if, if they've gotten their response and gotten their six cycles, we just watch them closely. So in that case, uh, it may be, it, you know, patients may not, will just be getting watched very closely because that's what we do anyway. OK, so we have to meet what the usual standards would be in clinical trials. And none of us want to put a none of us want to put a patient on a clinical trial that we don't feel comfortable with. And we and we wouldn't. My rule for a clinical trial is I'm not going to offer a patient a clinical trial that I wouldn't offer to a family member. And there are times that a patient would be eligible for the clinical trial that I say, no, I think you have better options at this point because th there are there are other options available now saying that. With the way in platinum resistant ovarian cancer trial, most of the time it's going to be clinical trials because those activities seem more exciting than what's available. Mm -hmm. And I, since we've had a lot of talk about clinical trials and there's a variety of questions about it, I guess sort of how do you recommend patients bringing that topic up with their doctor or asking about what's available out there if it's not something that you yeah. know their doctor is bringing up with them? So I think there's a couple things you can do. You can do something. Uh, you can go to clinicaltrials.gov. Clinicaltrials.gov. The search engine's not great on it. It's it, clinicaltrials.gov. Okay, it's 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 sponsored by our, uh, our, our uh, I think by the I think NCI up, updates it, and you can put in ovarian cancer and you can uh, 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 you know look for trials, and in those trials they have within y your you know uh, within your state, or you can go to like the Ohio State website and put in ovarian cancer 
and see what trials we have open if you live within a driving distance of Ohio State or if you live in driving distance of large centers. About half of all women, you know, a little bit more than half of women are treated at places that don't do that much ovarian cancer. And thus, if they don't do that much ovarian cancer, they're not going to have clinical trials. So, so first of all, be proactive, okay? Uh, uh, look at the sites that are within a driving distance. Most of their websites usually are pretty good or pick up the phone and call. Say, hey, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm interested in, in, in getting a second opinion. I'd like to come down about clinical trials, okay? Uh, secondly is, hey, I, I just saw a talk and uh, I was really impressed at some of the clinical trials which are available in platinum-resistant ovarian cancer. Do I have platinum-resistant ovarian cancer? Yes, no right? Mm -hmm. Oh, you, yes, I do. Okay. Well, I was really impressed with some of the clinical trials. Uh, what clinical trials do you have here in platinum resistant ovarian cancer? Now, <sighs> I gotta be careful what I say here. There, there are many practitioners who, who really don't want patients to leave their practice to go elsewhere for, mm -hmm. for different therapies. Okay. Uh, you just heard my passion for the availability of clinical research in the modest outcomes in, platinum, in our current therapies on platinum-resistant ovarian cancers. So they may say, oh, yeah, Ohio State has that trial, but I don't really like that trial. Or I, that doesn't seem right to me, right? Well, you know, leave that, you know, make sure that you, you, you make those, get those opinions yourself and look what those options are. And I'm not, I, I, I'm, I'm not here to, to have everybody on this webcast come to a house. I'm not saying that there's a lot of centers out there uh, that have a lot of clinical trials for GYN cancer, specifically, obviously ovarian cancer. And if you're somebody with platinum resistant, you can actually put in clinicaltrials.gov, platinum resistant ovarian cancer. And that search engine is usually pretty good. You're going to be overwhelmed because the number of trials which come out, but then you can kind of go through that and see which trials are open close to, to where you live. Or you can go to those websites and they often have, or just call and say, hey, I'd like to get a second opinion to see which clinical trials are available for me. Great, thank you. Really important information for everyone to have today. So looking at the time, I think we have, you know, enough time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, and so I think this is a quick one, but when do you think the results uh, surrounding Neva Nevolucan. Yeah, so Neva yeah, ne ne is is actually the preliminary results. The, the early trial has already been released, which is kind of what I showed here today. The large, big, big trial, it just is starting. So if you're interested in that uh, and you're eligible for it, gosh, jump, jump on that trial because that is that is a, a, a trial which is, you know, it's probably going to be a couple of years until those results are released because we're just starting to enroll patients now. So we have to enroll all the patients, then we have to wait for sometimes a year, sometimes two years to get those results. But so access to that drug probably for the next two to three years will only be through clinical trials. So um, I would love for, I'd love for, uh, you know, I highlighted again, I, I couldn't, I didn't have time to highlight all of them and I didn't want to bore people with a zillion PowerPoint slides, but I did uh, highlight obviously some that are ongoing and active right now and some that we may be hearing about shortly. So thank you for everybody's attention. Uh, clinical trials is is, is my friend, Dr. Larry Copeland, who's also at Ohio State, says is the opportunity to get tomorrow's therapies today. Tomorrow's therapies today. And centers which don't participate in clinical trials or have very few clinical trials, uh, 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 you know, don't be afraid to, to get other opinions at places that have more clinical trials. And uh, I, my only... My only commitment is to you, the patient, uh, and, 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 and the family who is allowing patients to have the best access to the best therapy. So thank you for your time today. That's such an important message to, to end today's webinar with. So thank you, Dr. O'Malley, for this incredibly informative program and spending all this time on the Q&A. And thank you to everyone who participated and submitted these great questions. Um, make sure to check out our upcoming ovarian uh, programs and support groups, which are listed on the SHARE website. 
Uh, and also be sure to fill, uh, follow us on social media where you can get all the latest updates. Please take a moment to fill out the survey at the end of the webinar. The survey will show up in the browser when the webinar ends, and the link will also be in the follow-up email. All surveys are anonymous, and we use that information to continue to improve our programs. Uh, this concludes the webinar. Thank you again, everyone, for participating. And thank you, Dr. O'Malley. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. You too.